What is Hadoop? Other than a really fun name for a cool technology. Hey everyone, Garth Schulte from CBT Nuggets. In this micro nugget, we're going to take the covers off of Hadoop, see what it's all about, some of the challenges that it solves in the world of big data. We'll even look at the technology stack around Hadoop. Hadoop has gotten so popular over the last few years that a literal ton of projects have popped up around it to make it more usable and attractive to work with. To really understand Hadoop, it helps to understand the problem that Hadoop solves. And it's all around big data. And we're talking about terabytes and petabytes of data. Big companies, Twitter, Facebook, eBay, Amazon, Google. How do these companies make sense of petabytes of data? And how do they do it efficiently in a time-friendly manner? Especially with the data explosion that's occurred over the last few years, even our personal data footprints are exponentially growing. Big data can be characterized using the three Vs, volume, velocity, variety. How do we work with terabytes and petabytes of data? How do we do it in a time-friendly manner? And with data coming from all over the place in a variety of different formats, how do we work with many different formats of data from many different data sources? So the answer to big data's challenges lie in distributed computing. Spreading our data across an army of machines that all work together to process and serve up that data is the answer to the three Vs. Now, let's just step back for a minute. I know somebody out there is saying, hey, Garth, why do we need distributed computing? Why can't we use traditional computing means of a big, expensive server with lots of hard drives attached, rate-enabled for fault tolerance and performance, or even a couple of them, a cluster or a gaggle of these high-end machines? And the reason is disk transfer rates. They haven't evolved at nearly the pace of Moore's Law with processors, right? Every few years, we get double the processing power. Disk transfer rates have barely evolved at all. We'd be lucky to get 100 megabytes per second right now off of disks. Network bandwidth falls under the same category, which is an extremely valuable resource, especially on the internal network. So if we're using this model to process terabytes of data, we're going to bring our entire network to a screeching halt. And on top of that, all of our disks will be I.O. bound at 100 megabits per second. To read one terabyte of data, it'd take two and a half hours to read all that data. On the flip side, with distributed computing, say we had 100 low to middle end machines, each with a disk attached, it would take about two and a half minutes to read that same terabyte of data. So this is where Hadoop comes into play. It's a software-based distributed computing model. It's an open source framework built in Java. And, and the real beauty of Hadoop is that it maximizes strengths. Our strength right now, the CPU. And it mitigates our weaknesses. Our weaknesses being our disk transfer rates and our network bandwidth. It does so by bringing computation to the data. So how does it do it? And how are big companies using Hadoop to solve their big data challenges Let's go check out the inner workings of Hadoop and see what it's all about. So Hadoop is really made up of two core components. We have HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, which is used for storage. And we have MapReduce, which is what we're going to use for data retrieval. We write jobs in Java or other languages and tools that will uh, pull the data out of our cluster. Now, how this works here is, is you essentially have two kinds of nodes. You have the name node, and then you have data nodes. So kind of a, a master-slave kind of architecture. The name node is just simply there to keep track of where all the data is in the cluster. A data node is just that. It's just simply a data node that stores data. So how this works then is, say we have a petabyte file, and we want to put a petabyte file into our cluster. We would do that, send it through HDFS using the command line utilities. It's a lot like working with a regular uh, file system. You know, you can copy, you can make directories, all that fun stuff. So we'd copy our petabyte file into here, HDFS would then break that file up and spread it across all the nodes in the cluster. And the cool thing is here, once you set up Hadoop, you can configure a replication factor, which is where our fault tolerance comes from. So it'll, it'll make sure that on all of our data nodes, three copies of that data are always inside of the cluster. And what that means is if we lose a data node, so what? That data is already replicated. It's already out there. So we, we, we suffer no data loss. The name node, which keeps track of where the data is on each cluster, will recognize that. There's an active monitoring system in Hadoop. And then it'll take the data that was on that cluster and re-spread it out. So again, we're always at three copies of data. On the other side, we have MapReduce. MapReduce is our programmable framework for retrieving data. And programmers will fire up Java and they'll write the map function and the reduce function. So it's a two-step process, hence map reduce. Map is what goes and gets the data, tells the cluster what data we want. Reduce then aggregates all of that return data. 
And this is actually really cool. This is how it brings computation to the data. Once a, a, a MapReduce job is submitted to the cluster, the job tracker will take that jar file, that compiled Java binary that contains our map and reduce function, and send it to all of the data nodes. So the data nodes will then fire up that binary and work locally on the data. So what kind of data are we talking about here? And, and what do companies do? What kind of analytics do they run on this data? Well, first, the kind of data, industry data, things like retail data, manufacturing data, pharmaceutical data, good candidates, scientific data, weather data, satellite feed data, system data, log files. Oh, we know how big log files can get, right? How do you make sense of all that data? Hadoop's a perfect spot. Network data, same thing. Legacy data as well. So this, these are the just, just a sampling of some of the kinds of data you'll see out there. But what companies do with them, especially the big companies, all these, uh, all these companies have Hadoop uh, running in some form or another inside of their data centers. But Yahoo, for instance, they have 40,000 computers running Hadoop. That's insane. <laughs> I think their biggest cluster is somewhere around 4,500 nodes, and they do it for ad targeting, ad systems, and web searches. And, and, and a lot of companies use big data to improve their processes, to understand their customer base and their users and even themselves better. Amazon, for instance, Amazon, they know you, they know me. <laughs> Anytime I buy something on Amazon, somehow they magically know that I would also like this, which nine times out of 10, I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. And they do that through recommendation engines uh, because they, they, they use machine learning algorithms to understand you. And it works quite well. It's, there's a reason they're, they're, they're massive, right? <laughs> it's because they're smart. Uh, Facebook, another one. They boast they have the largest Hadoop cluster in the world, but, uh, but we don't know what it is. What we do know is they have over 100 petabytes of data. How do you data mine 100 petabytes of data? Hadoop. Hadoop is how you do it. Twitter, 450 million tweets a day. Same thing. How do you data mine that kind of information? Hadoop. Spotify, they have a 700-node cluster. They use it for uh, same kind of thing, recommendation engines on, on music. You listen to a song. Hey, look, everybody else that listened to this song also liked this. Here you go. You'll probably like this. Another thing, Hadoop works really well with all kinds of data, all different formats. This is where the flexible comes into play. Structured, semi-structured, unstructured, you name it, you put it into Hadoop. As long as you can, you can parse it using MapReduce, you can get the data. I've worked with data in XML formats, JSON formats, just regular old text data, uh, and even delimited data like comma and tab delimited as such. But the list goes on and on, really. It works with all kinds of data. So you've seen that Hadoop is reliable. Because of HDFS, our data is replicated. If we lose a node, not a big deal. That data will just get re-replicated across our cluster. It's scalable. If all of a sudden our MapReduce jobs are starting to slow down because our data keeps piling up, okay, we'll just add another node into the cluster, which is really easy to do. It's literally installing Hadoop, registering with the name node, and boom, you're done. It's in the cluster and working, and, and data is already getting replicated to it. We saw that it's flexible, and we saw that it's high performance because it takes advantage of the strengths in computing, which is a processor, and mitigates the weaknesses, which is disk transfer rates and bandwidth. Now, check out all the technologies that have popped up around Hadoop over the years. And this is in no way a comprehensive list. This is just some of the more popular ones. Uh, and, and the reason these are popping up is because people want to use Hadoop and want to work with it. But not everybody knows Java or the low level that is HDFS and MapReduce inside of Hadoop. So, so for instance, Pig and Hive, they're languages to retrieve data as an alternative to MapReduce. Now, underneath the hood, they actually just make MapReduce jobs, but Pig is a data flow language, very easy to, to pick up and get the hang of to pull data out of Hadoop. And Hive was actually developed by the Facebook engineers who said, hey, you know what? There's a lot of SQL professionals out there. We have a lot of SQL professionals here in Facebook, and we want to allow them to write ad hoc queries and jobs against the data inside of a cluster. So they build Hive. So you'll feel right at home in Hive if you're a SQL professional. Evro is a data serialization technology. So you can take the state of your objects inside of your applications and serialize them to physical data on disk. Zookeeper is a coordination technology that also manages partial failures within the cluster. Scoop and Flume are both data integration technologies, so you can pull data out of things like SQL Server, PostgreSQL, MySQL, uh, and then you can also take data out of Hadoop and put them into all of those, into the relational structures. HBase is, is how you do random read access inside of a Hadoop cluster. Hadoop is meant for batch processing. Write once, read many. So HBase gives us kind of that uh, relational feel once again, where a lot of seeks happen and allows you to do random read and write access. And Mahout is pretty awesome. It's a machine learning project 
that contains many algorithms for things like recommendation engines, ad targeting, or, or what they like to call collaborative filtering. That's a, a fancy word for recommendation engines. Uh, but so, so these are just, just a small sampling of the tools that uh, can help us manage and, and work with the data inside of our cluster. So Hadoop's going to be a major player in the future, especially as these technologies merge and Hadoop matures. It's going to become a lot more accessible, easier to implement, and you'll see a lot more than just the big players using it. Small and medium-sized businesses will be picking it up. So now's the time to get on the Hadoop bandwagon. In the CBT Micro Nugget, we answered the question, what is Hadoop? We saw that it's a scalable, cost-effective, flexible, and fault-tolerant distributed software solution for big data. We can spread our big data across a distributed file system and then write jobs that process in parallel to pull that data back. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.